Hey everybody, welcome to episode 14 of the uh, May 2017 estate sale finds and uh, this uh, this episode should conclude the uh, items that I bought in the second trip to this estate and uh, one of the items that I grabbed was uh, this is something I saw on the first trip out kind of ignored it didn't think I really wanted it and then on the second trip again like I said uh, several people had come through uh, apparently not noticed this or not thought much of it didn't make much of an offer so I was able to get this really cheap when I bundled it with a bunch of other stuff but what this is is this is a black and Decker industrial heavy-duty model drill sharpener and uh, when he fired it up and it seems to work pretty good we're as quiet as a kitten nice and smooth not a lot of vibration and uh, what we got here if we can get a Kind of a better look at the business end of things here is we've got this uh, almost works like a drill chuck with the jaws so as I advance this it's going to allow it to clamp on different size drill bits okay and uh, you insert your drill from the back side here and clamp it and what happens is when you swivel this there's a there's a some sort of a camming action in there um, now, what happens is it's going to actually rotate this around to mimic what the guys who really know what they're doing can do rolling their hand uh, or wrist as they do a hand grind on a, uh, on a regular um, pedestal grinder. So I think I'm probably going to keep this because... Uh, this is for smaller drill bits, obviously. I'm not sure what the max size drill you can do on this thing is. The instructions are on here. It seems pretty straightforward. And I think uh, this might actually allow me to do a pretty decent job of, uh, of grinding, regrinding small drill bits. You know? So um, I don't know how everything works, but there's a D and S over here. Oh, I see. This is moving. This is moving the, uh, this part changing the uh, relationship of the distance so I'll have to read up on it get the instructions and everything but I'm not gonna waste time with that here this is just about the, the, the show and tell of what I picked up so if anybody has one of these and they've used it before and has any uh, I'm just kind of curious whether or not they find it a useful tool or whether or not it's uh, just one of these uh, you know kind of drill sharpening things that uh, went the way of the dodo bird this is a box of junk that I just kind of picked up real quick and uh, saw not much of interest in it, but kind of grabbed it. Um, what I did notice was uh, this part right here. There is a uh, little indicator on here, but more importantly, this part right here, because the color of the metal and everything on it, I think this may have been part of the... Uh, that Taylor Hobson profilometer, or, or uh, I forget what I called it now, but that Taylor Hobson unit that was there, uh, Taylor Hobson Tally Surf. I think this might have been part of that. The manufacturer on this indicator is one I've never heard of, Beatty, B A T Y. This definitely is part of the Tally Surf because it's got the same, remember that V block? If you guys have watched all of these, that V block I showed quite a while back had the same kind of mount. So this would have been definitely for the. Uh, to go in the tracks on the uh, table for the tally surf and uh, this indicator actually has an interesting little uh, pedigree this one is a John Bull British Indicators Limited made in England so that's kind of neat I, I find it a little neat uh, definitely seems like maybe it needs a little attention but that's a John Bull dial indicator These are marked roughness standards, uh, Taylor Hobson. So I think these are used for calibrating the, uh, the tally surf. Um, probably not much use now. And this one, actually, somebody took the uh, actually extra care to put this one back in its box. So really just a piece of history now. Calibration standard, rank Taylor Hobson, Lester, made in England. 
This is just a used QO style breaker. Uh, I think I already mentioned I had found some other ones there and I put them all together and took those because they'll fit my sub panel. And then there's a couple of who and Jim Diggies here. I'm not sure what these are for. Some kind of clearly little jigs or mounts or something. These look like indicator backs. Here's another one of these Beatty indicators. This one's sticky, but it, it works. And they're small, too. You notice how small they are? It's about the size of a half dollar. Here are some sort of items that look like they plug into somewhere to maybe calibrate something. They've got numbers on the back, and if you lift up these little doors, you've got little set screws to make some sort of little trimmer adjustment. And, uh... These might have plugged into maybe the back of one of the electronic, uh, the electrical boxes that were going that went with that tally surf. There's just a plug, a funky one. A couple of rollers, a cord that goes from that type of deep D-type pin plug there to oh, well, it looks like almost like a Cat Five. I wonder what that went to. This is a three and a half millimeter mono to three and a half millimeter mono jumper. This little box here, which has several weird little pieces that I think also probably were tally surf parts. Oh yeah, definitely. Matter of fact, that's even got the uh, that's got the little T H Taylor Hobson logo right on it. So these were definitely extra pieces. For the tally surf and I believe this is a reading transducer or something for the tally surf not sure what but so this is all uh, most of this is going to be junk I think so on my first trip there I went into a side room and uh, I spotted this and uh, it didn't look like this when I first saw it it was put together with uh, some other pieces bolted to it and everything and I didn't really pay much attention to it and then on the second trip, when I was just adding stuff in and uh, getting stuff dirt cheap, I went back and decided, hey, maybe I'll take a chance on that thing. And looked at it more closely and realized that uh, there was a drill press table. Bolt. This was bolted to a drill press table. And what it was was there, were, there was a drill press there for sale, and it was a uh, Craftsman floor standing drill press. And I had noticed that the... Um, part of the arm was still on the post of the drill press but it was broken off the casting had snapped well lo and behold in a completely different room off to the side I found this bolted to said um, drill press table so what had happened was uh, whoever had that drill press had taken this XY table okay and bolted it onto the table for the drill press and then as if things weren't bad enough on top of that they bolted down this crap this large craftsman drill press vise now i don't know how much this thing weighs but it's pretty heavy actually this is a large one i've got one like this now not a craftsman but a different brand it's quite a bit smaller than this this thing's pretty beefy this has got looks like eight and a quarter inch jaws on it and I mean overall the length on this thing it's 14 inches so you this will open up and take a pretty good sized piece in there this craftsman drill press vise even though it's craftsman is actually in excellent shape a little bit of surface rust on the handle but no big deal there so I figured well that was a good deal got that but I unbolted it from that I unbolted the table because I explained to the guy who didn't even realize it that that was the table for his broken drill press. But I said, the problem is you're going to have to get a new arm because it was the arm had broken off that supported the table. Either that or, you know, it's a casting. So uh, I'm not going to, don't get me started on welding castings. But um, so this is actually pretty nice. To, uh, like I said, drill press vise. And the XY table. It's got a sticker that's still barely clinging to uh, to the grease that's on here that says made in Taiwan. So this is an import um, XY table, but it's a good size one. It's got some surface rust on it here. You can see here, this is clean as a whistle where the uh, vise had been sitting on it for all these years. Um, 
this is uh it's about 18 and uh three quarter inches well 18 and five eighths length uh by just about six inches width and the only thing i can find wrong with this is this handle this little handle right here on the hand wheel is bent and i know that's just a screw inside there i know that if i try and bend up on this it's probably going to snap right there so i'm not going to be bother even trying but uh it's a miracle that that's all that's wrong with this thing because i envision that this whole thing took a pretty good drop when that thing snapped so anyways um even though this is an import it's actually still a pretty decent table um, and I've seen these tables, uh, like this sell for, you know, hundred, 120 bucks used. So that's a pretty good score there. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to keep that or not. I mean, I, part of me is thinking I might want to put this on one of my drill presses, but one of my larger drill presses, something that's got a much beefier table, like maybe the SIP drill press that's got a table that could handle this all right so let me show you the last three items i bought on the second trip to the estate sale this is the blue cabinet that i kept mentioning in a, the previous episode that all of that stuff was inside of that i bought so i bought the this cabinet with the contents and uh when i uh went there the first time i never even saw this cabinet i think it had a blanket or something over it and uh there was a big um there's a big industrial oven sitting on top of it. So anyways, I ended up uh, taking a look at the cabinet, saw the stuff inside, was interested in it, and then I noticed the maker's name on the cabinet. And it turns out this is a Stanley Vidmar cabinet. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Vidmar is a uh, industrial line of cabinets and um, toolboxes and things like that. Um, that uh, are very expensive and they're very sturdy this and this thing lives up to its name this thing is uh, I could stand on top of this thing no problem so I weigh about 215 pounds these days you can see that thing is rock solid now if that had slide out drawers on it that cabinet would be worth probably even used somewhere around four six seven hundred dollars somewhere in that range but this particular cabinet, all it has inside is uh, some shelves. So that's all it's inside are uh, some shelves. And uh, I was pleased to see that in addition to the, to the uh, shelves, the other magnetic latch, which goes down the bottom there, was inside. This is the original handle. Somebody had removed the handle I put this block of wood on there for some reason and I have absolutely no idea why but I'll be able to take that block of wood off and put the original handle back on it is missing one of the plastic end caps uh, no key so I'll have to change out the change out the mechanism if I want to uh, um, if I want it to lock and I, I think I'm actually gonna sell this because it's um it, it, it's a really nice storage cabinet and I just don't think I really need something like this right now down in the shop and I may kick myself in the head for selling it later but right now as you can see I have no room for it so it's sitting out here in the outdoor uh, shed in the box tent deal so I certainly don't want it sitting out here come winter uh, so that's one of the three items <laughs> so this is uh, one of the other items that I picked up and uh, I saw this on the first trip it was sitting on top of a desk and sitting on top of it was a small TV set <laughs> and uh, so that's what job it had been doing but what this is is a cast iron surface plate uh, it looks like heck right now because what I did when I got it here uh, and I I put it here in the in the shed that the tent uh, I took a uh, can of spray grease and I sprayed a film of grease all over the top of it to help uh, keep flash rust from getting all over it. Um, there's a couple of footprints on it because the kids, not once, but twice, managed to step on it. <laughs> and get grease all over their sneakers. So you'd think, you know, 
and, and, and I could tell from the footprints it was the same kid both times. And no, he didn't do it on, you know, the two times on one occasion. No, he did it once. I told him not to do it again, and he did it again. Kids. Well, anyways. So I gotta get that. I gotta find a spot for that down in the shop and get that down there. I'm gonna be keeping that. Um, so I got that for twenty bucks. So I couldn't couldn't pass up on uh, a deal on on that. So I don't have a big granite surface plate or anything. So this will be my surface plate. And I've looked all over it and can't find any makers' names or anything. Um, but that style with those handles on the side like that, I've seen them. Um, so I guess I don't have much more to say about that. Well, it's 24 inches by 18 inches. So uh, the way I came to spend 20 bucks on that is uh, I told the guy I'd be interested in buying that only if he'd be willing to sell it to me for scrap. Then we had a long conversation about scrap that involved me making some phone calls. Because he tried to tell me that uh, he gets... I think he said 35 or 38 cents a pound for all his scrap. I said, not for steel. I said, that's by gross ton. So uh, <laughs> I said, you'd be lucky to get eight cents a pound right now for that. Oh, no, no, no. I, I didn't know what I was talking about. So I called my scrap yard, had him tell me on the speakerphone how much it was per gross ton. And then I whipped out my uh, phone did some math showed him well oh no no his place gives more so what's your place no problem he gives me the name away he goes I call them up on the phone put them on speakerphone not only uh, do they not give 38 cents a pound for steel uh, or heavy steel they give less than the first place I called so when we finally figured out how many cents a pound he was going to get for the thing, the next thing we had to do was figure out how much it weighed. Well, he had an assistant there, and the assistant picked it up, and he said, he thinks it's about 170 pounds or so. The guy didn't believe that. Then they pulled out a bathroom scale, and the big guy picks up the cast iron plate and gets on the scale. Then he, gets, then he subtracts his weight. And wouldn't you know what this thing came in at like 168 pounds on that scale i mean it was unbelievable how close he got so then we did some quick math 168 times the whatever cents a pound it was and it came to like 17 bucks and i said i tell you what i'll give you 20 bucks for it so that's how i came to get this cast iron surface plate for 20 bucks and that brings us to the last item i have for uh this episode which will conclude the second trip to this estate and uh in the next episode we'll start with the stuff that i picked up on the third trip out yep i kept going back this is i think going to be in the uh keep pile for me um so what this is is this is a tilting swiveling table so we got the uh, t-slots in here and this whole part right here tilts and then this whole part here swivels and this is made apparently by a company called Hartford now I think there's another name on this on this placard over here it basically it says Hartford special super table okay so that's the name of it it's a Hartford special super table from what I can look up online, it's a uh, obsolete, or I shouldn't say obsolete, but it's an antiquated uh, piece, a company that is either either no longer in business or has mutated into some other company or been swallowed up by some other company. But uh, it's a cute little, uh, it's a cute little accessory. It'd be a nice fit on my mill. It's not. You know too big and it looks like it's a nine inches by ten inch table on the top there and I think that might come in handy at some point all right everybody this is gonna conclude episode 14 um, when I return with episode 15 I will start to show you a few items I picked up on my third trip back to this estate